Hello, party people. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, just just going to give everyone a 30 seconds or so to jump in um, just for the keen beans. And firstly, nice work. Uh, if someone could please just jump into the chat and just let me know if the slides and audio are coming through okay. That would be awesome. Thank you, Marion. Thanks, Christy, Anna. Yep, a bunch of people. It's working. Happy days. This is good. Uh, awesome, guys. Look, uh, I've been out of the saddle for uh, a little minute. I've uh, I've just come back from a, a bit of a trip away. So, uh, you know, feeling like I'm happy that it's all working as it should. Um, guys, look, just while uh, everyone's jumping on, as we're going through today, um, uh, please feel free to pop any general banter into the chat box. Happy days. And uh, But if you've got any questions, and I will sort of pause, and I'm happy to get a little bit off track answering questions as we go through the content, please pop them into the Q&A box. Uh, it's just a little bit easier for me to, to see and to just make sure that anything, um, nothing gets missed essentially. Also at the end, I'm gonna have a, um, a longer Q&A and, and try to get through as many of those as I can. So whether it's questions related to the content specifically or you know just uh, general uh, ideas, try to probably keep them focused on money, but um, yeah, feel free to hook them into to the Q&A. So guys, um, look, I think this is a, a, an interesting topic. Uh, I think particularly uh, today in the environment that we're in at the moment, um, I totally get that for some people. It's like thinking about creating generational wealth might seem like a bit of a stretch uh, because, you know, we've got cost of living crisis and interest rates are high and, and inflation crisis and all of those sorts of things. Um, but uh Look, at the end of the day, for most people, there are things that you can be doing right now that will make today easier as a first step and then help you make smart moves for the future. And then ultimately to create enough wealth that you're not just setting yourself up, but you're setting up yourself for the generations to come as well. So I'm pumped to I'm pumped to get into it. Um, sorry, I have just seen a couple of uh, questions or comments come through uh, about the recording. Yes, we are recording this. Yes, we'll uh, circulate it after uh, the session. It will be available for a limited amount of time for you to uh, to check out. But my jokes are funny alive, so you know, stick around uh, for that as well. All right. So, uh, firstly. Big shout out to our event partners for this session, Perla. Um, look, if you've been living under a rock and you're not familiar with what these guys are doing, uh, you should definitely check them out because they are up to some really cool stuff. Perla is a platform that helps people with long-term investing um, and very much aligned with the, the themes that we're talking about today around setting up uh, you know, wealth for yourself and, and wealth for generations to come. Um, we don't get any kickbacks or anything from the work that we do on both sides. Uh, Perla just are very aligned with, with the pivot world philosophies and vice versa. We know they do great work and they've got good stuff, um, which, which drives the, the, the partnership essentially as well. So guys, look, um, before I get into the content, uh, just general disclaimer, uh, I was never here, this never happened, um, but all, in all seriousness, guys, please don't rush out and make any life-changing decisions. I strongly suggest you seek out personalized advice before jumping in. Now, uh, for anyone that is uh, new to Pivot Wealth and our content, if anyone's uh, here for the first time at one of our events, I'd love to. I'd love for you to uh, throw that into the chat as well. Um, but if you're not familiar with what us and, and what we're about, we do a ton of events like this. So we've got a few events that are coming up. Uh, I've got a few newbies that are coming through on the chat. Nice one. Thank you for that. Um, there, yeah. So that if you could look on the our Eventbrite page, you'll see the events that we've got coming up. We've also got a podcast, and uh, there's a fair bit that goes out on socials as well. So if you want to level up your money, you know, and, and build your knowledge around things like this, but also just generally, you know, how to save more, how to invest smarter, how to save tax, um, do definitely check that out. There's also a bunch of stuff on the Pivot Wealth website as well. 
Um, also, guys, so got if you want to dive deeper, I've got a couple of books. Um, my uh, second book that, that's on this slide here, um, uh, thanks for that, Brad, uh, is uh, Get Unstuck, which I actually first released in 2018, and I've it's been revamped for 2024, coming out later this month. Um, for anyone that checks out our event, right, you'll see that there's actually a special live launch event that's coming up on the 28th of May. Um, I've got some pretty special stuff planned for that, some content that I've actually never shared with non-clients. So, uh, you know, if you're interested in this sort of stuff, I would strongly suggest that you uh, you register for that event. That content is only going to be available for people that are registered for the event. The recording is not going online. Uh, it will not go anywhere because this stuff is... Uh, it's there's a lot of IP that's gone into this content. So um, yeah, if, if you want to check that out, I reckon it's worth a, a worth a, a, an hour of your time for sure. Um, and also if you want to see more about these books, you can check out um, pivotwealth.com.au forward slash books. Um, we've even got someone listening from Japan. Nice one, Andy. Um, great. So uh, look, guys, getting into it, and just to sort of set the scene here, I've got a bit of an example showing, you can look at this as investing for your kids, but you could also look at it as just investing for yourself. I've got an example looking at the long, long-term return on the Australian share market, 9.8%, um, and looking at compounding, um, looking at compounding uh, and how that will grow over time. Basically, starting with zero dollars today, getting that long term share market return, how your money would actually grow. So, I've got some different levels here that if you were to save and invest five dollars a day, that and you do this for a kid today, by the time they get to age 21, you'd have about 125,000 um, uh, dollars saved, saved or in investments. Um, ten dollars a day, two hundred fifty thousand. Twenty dollars a day, half a million dollars. Forty dollars a day, you're making your kids a millionaire, uh, and they're they're going to be pretty happy on their twenty first birthday, I would imagine. Um, I note with these examples that this is not about, and I'm going to dive deeper into the specifics of what sort of investments you could be choosing to actually get these sorts of returns, but. This is not about stock picking or speculation. This is literally just investing into the share market average, something like a, um, a boring index fund where you get the, the market return. No stock picking or speculation, just let the money grow and consistently save and invest. So you see that it's it's pretty powerful. You know, 125 grand, that's probably a property deposit. 250K definitely is half a million or a million dollars. It's like you're 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 really accelerating your own journey or your kids' journey to to their uh, you know financial freedom or, or whatever label you want to put on that. But look, the reality is that you have to get started and and um the fear of making a mistake leads to inaction. And that's a lot of people, whether it's investing for themselves or investing for future generations, they think about investing. You know, you probably should be investing. You may come along to a webinar like this or, um, you know, you see some content, you're like, oh, I should do that. But then you go to do it. You don't want to do something dumb that ends up costing you money that you end up later regretting. And so as a result, uh, you do nothing. And then that leads to you missing out on the opportunity to get the compounding um, working for you. So uh, that's what, as we go through today, what uh, the main thing that I really want to get across is helping you understand it enough so that you can push through that um, fear and, and, and sort of uh, reduce the, the fear that surrounds investing, whether it's to get started investing or to get started investing more. I'll also give you some hacks as to how to find the money to invest a bit more, which I think is pretty relevant uh, in, the, in the climate that we're in today. Um, but essentially, put, clear that fear so that you can do more, take action and actually let the markets do its thing. Now, I will just say as well that when it comes to your money, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this stuff and there are really clear stages that people go through that you start from the building blocks and then you progress through. So firstly, you want to set your financial foundations, then direct your focus to uh, the things that are going to move the dial to actually start making progress. And then um, opt you, you want to be optimizing what you're doing. From there, you can launch and accelerate and then it gets into the impact stage. And the reason that I bring this up is when I talk about generational wealth, I fully recognize that there's going to be some people online today that are going, I just want to set myself up as a first step. And that is absolutely what you should be doing. That, that is absolutely where you want to get started because 
there's no point, you know, doing all these things for future generations until you've got your own uh, oxygen mask on on first. But the reality is that um, uh, as you as you go through these stages and look at what they actually mean, different things start making sense. And the right move at the wrong time is the wrong move. So you've got to make sure that you know you're you're not only you're doing smart things, but what's actually smart for you that really depends on where you're at today. And so on this slide, I've got, and I get that the writing is probably quite small um, on this, but like to give you one example, if I look at, we found that there are these seven main areas that you, you focus areas for your money, investing, tax, saving and spending, property and debt, superannuation, risk and planning. And if you think about progressing through these stages, there are key milestones that you want to meet in each of those different areas. If I look at the first column here, which is investing, for example, if you're just getting started, the foundations target that you've got here is that you've got a regular investment plan in place where you're investing automatically on at least a, a weekly basis. Then the next level up from that is that you're investing 5% of your income into share type investments. The next level up from that is that you're investing 10% of your income uh, in, in those sorts of investments. And then the next level is that you've got an investment income that's equal to the average income in Australia. The, le the level above that is that you've got an investment income at double um, the, the average income. And so what I'm getting at with this is that when you're doing the things that whatever it is that you choose to do with your money, you've got to make sure that those things make sense for where you're at now. And the good news is that particularly when it comes to investing and building generational wealth, that it is a really clear progression um, as you go through. So the stages do dictate what makes sense and what doesn't. I'll give you a practical example of this. Like if you think about something like investment bonds, they can be a great way to save tax because they're, um, you know, when you invest for the long term, you basically, the key rule with investment bonds is you invest for 10 years or more, and then you don't pay any capital gains tax. But because your money needs to sit there for that period, if you inv use investment bonds too early, it can be a mistake because you might probably want to need that. Uh, you probably want that money available to you to buy a, your first property or your, your first investment property or your second investment property. Also, if you're another example is that buying your own home is a really great thing to do with your money. But if you do it too early on in the piece, then you can be tie up all of your savings capacity, basically smash your savings capacity. And then it means that you can't do any investing other than just chipping away at your 30 year mortgage. So you want to get the timing right. And so keep in mind as we're going through the content today and looking at these different elements of investing, that there is no one set of right decisions for you because the right decisions for you, they depend on you and which stage you're at, what's important to you and the, the future that you've got in front of you as well. So look, as we go through, instead of me sitting here talking about, you know, here are the 17 steps that you can take to become a, a multimillionaire or create generational wealth. What I really want to help you do is to understand the key things that you need to be aware of and the key questions that you need to ask and answer so that when you do make moves with your money, that you are making the smart ones for you and where you're at right now. So guys, look, I get that um, everyone's situation is unique when it comes to their money, but there are three real, really common challenges that hold people back. The first one is information overload. It's like there's so many options out there, so much information. It's like you're drinking from the fire hose, hard to know who to listen to and who to trust. The second is that people struggle to really find the right balance between how do you get ahead for tomorrow, but also live a reasonable lifestyle today. And the third one is the faux fou. That's the basically the fear of effing it up, the fear of making a mistake that ends up costing you. And what happens as a result for most people is you end up getting stuck and you, you're stuck, not stuck doing nothing, but often you're just stuck doing the same thing that you've been doing in the past. And what that means is that you're missing out on the opportunities to be getting better results and getting more out of what you have uh, right now today. And so when, if, you're, if you want to nail it with your money, there are three areas that you need to get right. Your structure, strategy, and solution. So structure is all about making it easy to save and making it easy to manage your money. But when you think about things like generational wealth, 
making it crystal clear exactly how much money you've got to work with that you can actually direct to investing or building your wealth or setting things up for the future. The second piece is your strategy. And that's all about looking at what are the different pathways in front of you? What are the things that you could actually do to get ahead with your money? Not rocket science, what they are. You can save money in a bank account. You can buy shares. You can buy property. You can pay down debt. You can crank your super. But most people, it's some sort of combination of those things. But understanding what those options are and how do they impact you today, tomorrow, next month, and in the years ahead as well. And then the third is the investments. And that's where we're going to focus a lot of the conversation today is choosing good investment solutions to back up your strategy so that you know that when you do invest, you get reliable, consistent progress over time. You build your investment income and you avoid the chances of downsides and setbacks and those momentum killing mistakes. Now, what I've found is that if any one of those three elements is missing, it ends up dragging down on the other. So it doesn't matter if you've got awesome investments and you've got an awesome strategy, but you're not good at managing your money, it's going to be really hard for you to get the results that you want. Similarly, if you've got a good, you're good at saving and managing your money, good strategy, bad investments, you blow up your cash. Good at saving, good investments, no strategy, leaving money on the table, you're going to be super stressed out as well. So they are, it's not three steps. It is three elements that you, you sort of need to get right. Good news is as we go through today, I am going to focus in on the solutions, but I'm going to touch on the two other areas and help you understand how you can make your life a bit easier there as well. Um, just got, uh, just before I move on from there, someone just popped it into the question to say, ask if we could send a link for the event that I mentioned, the, um, the get unstuck event. So I'll just pop that into the, the chat. You can check that out there as well. All righty. So <clears throat> look, I'll, I put this, uh, quote from James Clear up here, which is you don't rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. And I think that's very true. If if anyone's seen one of my talks before, you may have seen me talk about this, but you know, setting goals is great. And it's great to have good ambitions around your money, good ideas, good things that you want to do, but that is not going to get you wealthy. It's not going to create generational wealth. You need to systemize your money success. So as we're going through Today, I want you to think about what you can do to systemize, to automate your investing, to automate your saving, to set things up in a way that gives you the best chance of success. So guys, I'm going to um, start with the basics and then we'll build from there. Some of this stuff you probably already know, um, but uh, we'll I'm going to lead from investing basics into what sort of investments you can choose and what are the advantages uh, if you want to create real generational wealth. Now, um, again, just to, to put this a little bit into context, um, cash is cash is a trap right? Uh, cash makes us feel good when we've got cash. And I don't mean physical cash. I mean like cash savings in a bank account, that it makes us feel good when we've got cash available. But when you look at long-term return on cash and the long-term return on cash after inflation, it is going backwards. And I've got an example here to share with you on that. I've looked at what it would look like saving money in a bank account versus investing money into the share market over 5, 10, 20, 30, and 40 years. Now, the, the number, and I just sort of picked a number out of the air with this, but saving versus investing, I've got $200 a week. So if you were to save $200 a week in a bank account versus invest $200 a week into the share market, after five years, your investments would be worth about $66,000, but this bank account would be worth $53,000. So you can see that there's a, a bit of a difference there. There's a 10, 10 and a bit thousand dollars better off as a result of investing versus uh, just saving money in a bank account. But over time, things the, the difference between the two really diverged. So after 10 years, you've got 110K savings account versus 175,000 investments. After 20 years, the difference is so much bigger, 230,000 savings account, 640,000 um, investment account. And then from 30 and 40 years, we're talking in the millions of dollars, that 363,000 savings account versus 1.8 million investment account and 500K versus $5 million over a 40-year period, which I get is a long time, but it shows the, the power and the difference between 
these two. Now, the good question from Kate there, it's based on the long-term return on the share market of 9.8% compared to the long-term return on cash of 3%. And so what I talk to a lot of parents that want to put money away for their kids and they save money in a in a savings account and look i can say for sure that saving money in a savings account for your kids is a lot better than not saving any money in a savings account for your kids but you don't really notice how much of a difference it is when saving in a bank account versus investing really unless you look at it when it's compared really side by side like this which you can't actually do in real life and you can see that the difference between this is drastic and so if you if you are saving for your kids and if the savings money is purely just sitting there you know you know that you don't it's not like you're saving money that you think you might need for them if you go on holiday or, or they need to get something for school or you know whatever other um whatever other things might be happening you know in your life if you know it's going to be there for the long term then you can see that investing is going to mean that it grows significantly faster and you end up with significantly more as a result. So I feel like that's a good uh, frame up for this discussion on investments. And I I am going to just start from the basics here that when you're, when you're looking at investments, there's essentially two broad groups of investments that you, you may consider uh, investing your money into. Firstly, you've got defensive investments and defensive investments are um, things like cash savings, savings, high interest savings accounts, fixed interest. That's like bonds and term deposits is the easiest way to explain it. But if you think of what it actually is in a super fund without getting too detailed about it, that you're looking at uh, like corporate bonds where it's like a term deposit, except you're lending the money to Woolworths or CBA and they pay a slightly higher return. Then on the other side of the ledger, you've got growth investments and growth investments are um, things that are designed to grow over time. Property, Australian shares, international shares. When you buy a property or you buy shares or you buy a, a shares in a property, um, you buy them for a value today. And so long as you choose a good one, the value is expected to increase over, over time. Very different from you compare that to a high interest savings account where you put money in a savings account that money is never intended to actually, the money that you put in is never intended to grow. It generates you income on like interest income on the money. And that's how your balance actually increases. Whereas with a share, you buy a share for $10, you hope in the future it's worth more than $10. And so one of the biggest decisions that you need to make as an investor, and when you're looking to build your own wealth and generational wealth is what is the mix between your defensive investments and growth investments. Now, defensive investments are really um, important and they're really, uh, the big advantage of defensive investments is that they're much less likely to go backwards. And that's why they call them defensive. Because if you put money into a savings account, you know that it doesn't matter what's going on in the economy or share markets, that your savings account balance will stay the same. Particularly in Australia, bank deposits are guaran uh, guaranteed by the government up to uh, $250,000. And so, you know, you know it's not going backwards. Whereas when you get into shares that the and property, like the price can go up and down a, a fair bit. That all being said, that that I I think that the purpose of defensive investments is to particularly if you're younger and you're still in the process of building your wealth that defensive investments are there to protect you from emergencies. If you're older and you're retired, then defensive investments can be there to pay you an income because income is more important than growth, for example. But the, the as I said, the advantage is that they don't go backwards. And if you're looking to grow your wealth, you're looking to grow, then in my opinion, you're probably going to want to be more pointed towards investing in growth investments like property and shares than you would be in defensive investments. Now, it's uh, for a lot of people when they get started investing for the first time, particularly when they don't understand investments, they feel like, oh, I should be when because they have these labels like balanced investor or growth investor or high growth investor. And people might feel like they should be more balanced. And often that means that they don't want to take crazy risk. But all that it really means is that the difference between a balanced investor, a growth investor, and a high growth investor, they still have this exact same investments in a lot of cases in their portfolio. It's just that they have more defensive investments 
and less cash or the other way around. So for a balanced investor, for example, you would look to have about half of your investments defensive and half of them growth. For a growth investor, you would have about 30% defensive and 70% growth. Whereas for a high growth investor, you're going to be almost entirely growth and almost zero in defensive investments. And so uh, one of the key drivers of which investments are right is your investment timeline. And we see with growth investments in particular, we know that over the long term, the share market trends up. But we know in the short term, it can go down and it can go down pretty considerably. When there is uh, serious events in the market like uh, the COVID pandemic, the GFC, um, you know, the, the Eurozone crisis, the share market can go down by 30, 40 or 50 percent. And if you if you invest in shares today and the market goes down by 50 percent, and you need to sell them for whatever reason, you are going to take a loss. And so what that means is that when you're, in my opinion, when you're investing into share type investments, you want to only invest money that you're confident that you can leave there for the long term to ride out these ups and downs of the market. Because if you choose good investments, and I'm going to talk about how you can do that, and you're never forced to sell your good investments at a bad time, then you know that you can let, allow your good investments to do what good investments do over the long term, which is ultimately to make you a bunch of money. And so your timeline is something that that is all important. I'm going to circle back on that um, a, a little bit later. Now, what that all means and how you can actually make sense of it when it comes to your actual investments is that when you're investing, figure out the money that you want to, to actually dedicate to investing and to growth and then you want to be invested in, in, with that money in growth shares, in my opinion. You That being said, you want to have cash that's going to cover you for your short-term, any short-term expenses that you've got planned and an, emer an, an emergency fund to fall back on. Um, but beyond that, cash, as I said, cash is going backwards relative to inflation and it's falling behind relative to shares. So uh, you, you probably want to be aiming to minimize your cash holdings as much as possible, which means that you make maximum progress getting ahead. I've got a question from Beck that says, any tips to move from defensive to growth investments? Well, um, the good the the good thing about defensive investments is that like if you've got cash sitting in a in a savings account there's generally not going to be any tax consequences of you moving the money if you talk about going the other way you go from a share portfolio and you want to put it into cash you need to be really aware of tax and i'm going to talk a little bit more about tax as we go through but you need to be aware of tax and make sure that you're not walking into a massive tax bill but if you've just got cash sitting in a bank account and you're wanting to invest it that's something that's quite easy to do now if you're if you've got a million dollars that you want to invest and it, you're going from cash, then you you probably just need to be a little bit considered in terms of how you do that. Um, but uh, you you and a, a couple of people I can see in the comments there that uh, you know you talk about in, do you invest in all at once? Are you going to invest a million dollars at a time, or do you dollar cost average and invest? you know, uh, 50 grand a week or 100 grand a week over a period of time. Now, I think there's no right answer to that question. It's the right answer depends on a number of factors. You know, where did the money come from? What is your plan? What other money have you got going on? But I generally, when we're tackling that question with clients, we sort of look at where are the markets um, today and, you know, how quickly do we want to get the money invested? I'm a little bit impatient, so I I generally, if I've got money that I want to invest, I want to invest it pretty quickly. Um, and so I, I try to make that you know, that time period fairly short, if that makes if that makes sense. Uh, another question about uh, investing in an offset versus uh, versus putting your money in a in an offset account versus uh, investing. And look the. An offset account is a lot better today than it was, you know, 24 months ago when interest rates were super low in that, you know, an offset on your own home is saving you essentially 6% after tax, whereas a share portfolio is going to be giving you nine, nine and a half, maybe 
Um, and that's before tax, maybe seven to 8% after tax, depending on what you're invested into. So if you say, if the question is, or if the question was, which is better, then you can run a calculation and say, well, shares are probably a little bit better, but they're only a little bit better. And so I suppose if you're if the if the question was instead what should I do then I would I, if you were asking me the question I would ask you a couple more questions back to see you know how much debt have you got what is your savings capacity and like for someone for say for a first home buyer that's just saved up their deposit they just poured all of their cash savings into buying a property their debt is quite high um you know, uh, at the highest point that it will be, their savings capacity is not super huge, then I might be more inclined to go with the offset and go, look, I know it's not probably not quite as favorable as investing into the share market, but it is giving me a guaranteed return. It's also getting my debt levels down, which makes me a lot, makes me sleep a bit better at night. Whereas on the flip side of that, if you'd own your home for ages and you got a $2 million property with a $200,000 mortgage and your cash flow was really strong, your savings capacity was really strong, then I would probably be a lot less inclined to put money in an offset or pay money down on a mortgage than I would be to invest money. So I get that I'm not giving you a sort of definitive answer, but I hope that um, I hope that makes sense, Povithra. Sorry, hope I'm saying that right. Um so that question from EC about tax, I'm going to come back to to tax. So if it's okay, I'll just I'm just going to park that one for now. All right. And so another thing that I think is important to to be aware of when you're investing is uh, good risk versus bad risk, or big company risk versus small company risk. And so on this slide, I've got two different investments: company one and company two. Company one, you could think of this like Commonwealth Bank or CSL or one of the like really big blue chip, so premium companies. And then company two is a, you could think of that like a tech startup company, like a small company. Now you see that both companies have ups and downs over time, but company two, the smaller company has a lot bigger ups and downs uh, and a lot more of them. And the reason for that is that if you look at the return profile on big companies, that Commonwealth Bank, for example, it's been around for 100 plus years. Uh, it's It's got all of these diversified revenue streams. It's got a rock solid operations team. It's got all this track record experience. So naturally, the performance of that business is going to be more stable than a tech startup company that's got an awesome idea that they may shoot the lights out, but they may also completely crash and burn. And the reason that I put this slide in is to say that a lot of people, when they're thinking about investing more or investing more seriously, they think that they, all risk is made the same. And they think that if they start going from being a balanced investor to being a high growth investor, that they're going to get more of this speculative small company risk in their investments. You don't need to. And in most cases, in my opinion, you probably don't want to. Sticking to those stable blue chip companies generally going to be a lot smoother return, a lot more predictable, a lot um, a lot more consistent in terms of the outcomes that you actually get. And so uh, not all risk is made equally. Even if you look at growth investments, defensive investments, you want to make sure you've got the right growth investments to get the right results. Now, I get that the the appeal of investing in small companies or penny stocks and you've got some 10 cent shares that could go to a dollar and you're going to make millions of dollars and you can retire in your 20s. But be aware that if you're expecting high returns or you're hoping for high returns, then that also comes with high risk. Reality is also that you don't need higher returns. You know, you see from that example at the start, you say $40 a day is going to make you a millionaire or make your kid a millionaire over a 20 year period. And so, yeah, it would be nice to have a million and a half dollars, but you could also end up with a hundred thousand dollars. And you know, if you're getting a million dollars for forty bucks a day, you know, how much risk do you actually need? And so, I, this is where I see a lot of people go wrong when it comes to investing or trying to create serious long-term wealth. They start investing and they go, "Oh, I'm just going to invest in these little companies because maybe that's going to accelerate things." Then they get burnt. Then they say, "Shit, this investing, this sucks. Like, why am I doing this? I picked a couple of companies. They perform poorly. Oh, all investing is risky. Oh, I shouldn't invest." 
And then before you know it, you've lost a decade and then you're playing catch up. So, you know, I, as I said, be aware, all risk is not made equally and choose the right risk when you invest. Now, diversification is another really powerful way to manage your risk. And again, in this example, I've got two companies. These are two premium or what I call blue chip companies just means big and stable and premium. If you invest and you could think of it like Commonwealth Bank of Woolworths, for example, the two companies are in different, they're in the same market, but they're in different industries. So the performance is going to be slightly different. Now, if you've got 10 grand and you put half into CBA and half into Woolworths, the return that you get is not going to be the return of any one. It's going to be the average of the two returns. Now, that's with two companies. If you put in three, 20, 50, 100, the, the return gets smoother and smoother over time. So you can, the more diversified you are with your investment approach, which means the more investments you have, the more underlying shares you have in your portfolio, the less your return is dependent on any one particular investment. Good news is that these days it's so easy to get diversified investments, which you can get through micro investing, managed funds, ETFs, and you basically just choose one option and it does the diversification for you. And this, in my opinion, is a really great way to invest. It's how I invest personally. It's how I advocate that all, all of our clients invest at Pivot Wealth as well. Now, <clears throat> um, I can see a bunch of questions coming through and thank you guys for those. Please keep them coming. I'm just going to wrap on this investment basics section by just talking about the market and index funds versus active funds. And so on this slide, what I've got is I've got the ASX 200, which is the 200 largest companies in Australia uh, by size, by value, essentially. These numbers are a little bit old now, but you'll, you'll take the point for this, that when I did this, the top 10 companies were what was listed here, Commonwealth Bank, Westpac, the banks, the mining companies, Woolworths, West Farmers, et cetera. Now we know what the value of those companies are. And when you see the news at night and they say, oh, the ASX has gone up by 1%, ASX means Australian Stock Exchange, if you're not already familiar, ASX has gone up by 1% or down by 1%. What that means is that the combined value of all of those companies has gone up or down by 1%. Now, realistically, some of them would have gone up, some of them would have gone down, and it's the overall outcome that they report when they talk about how has the share market gone today or this month or this year or whatever. So because we know what those companies are and we know what the proportions are, if you had enough money, you could just invest. We know that the total value of all 200 companies at this time was $1.67 trillion. Commonwealth Bank being valued at $200 billion equates to about 9% of this $1.7 trillion number. And so if you got a bunch of money and you put 8% into, well, almost 8.93% into Commonwealth Bank, 6.96% into Westpac, and et cetera, et cetera, the return that you would get on your investment portfolio would be exactly the same on the return as the return on the share market itself. And that's exactly what an index fund does. So when, when you hear people talking about index funds, and thankfully they're getting a lot more airplay today than they have in the past, all an index fund does is it simply looks at how the market is composed, what the bigger companies are, put more money with the bigger companies, less money with the smaller companies. And then the return that you get on that index fund is exactly the same as the return on the share market. The good thing about that is that we don't know what any company is going to do on a, on a weekly basis, monthly basis, or yearly basis, but we, do, uh, we are able to have a lot of confidence that over the long term, the share market is going to do what the share market has always done which is make a bunch of money. Now, the benefits of investing in an index fund, one, they're highly diversified. So you buy one index fund and it's investing into literally hundreds of different investments. They're also ultra low cost because it's literally just tracking what's going on in the share market, which is a lot easier to do than trying to figure out which investments are going to perform the best. They should all give you um, good peace of mind as well because the only way that the value of an index fund can go to zero is if every single company in the country goes bust at the same time. And if that happens, honestly, you've got bigger problems than your investment portfolio. Think about all of the banks going out of business tomorrow, all of the mining companies, the supermarkets, Telstra. Like we're talking about a, um, a zombie apocalypse type situation here. 
Now, the alternative to index funds or passive index funds is actively managed funds. And with an actively managed fund, as the name suggests, that you've got someone who is actively choosing the investments that make up that fund and then investing. And they're generally trying to pick the investments that they know will perform best or they, they think will perform best. And then they're hoping that that actually happens. Now, they active funds can be quite diversified, but... The, the promise of an active fund is, or the hope of an active fund is that they're trying to get out performance. They're trying to perform better than the market because they're more expensive than the market because they've got teams of people that are trying to run and operate these funds, plus they're run for profit. Um, and so they're, they're trying to perform better. And if they, if they weren't performing better, then you just wouldn't use them. You just invest into the market. Now, there's a lot of different ways to be right when it comes to investing, but the statistics show us that passive funds perform better than active funds more than 80 plus percent of the time. In some categories, it's more than 90 percent of the time. And given that they're cheaper, given that passive funds are cheaper, more diversified, and in my opinion, give you more peace of mind, uh, that's why I personally uh, favor them. But look, the reason that I um, that I include all of these stats in here is to say that when you're choosing your investments, I mentioned growth versus defensive is one of the big questions that you need to, to answer. Then it's like, what sort of shares do you want? Do you want speculative smaller shares or do you want big, bigger premium blue chip shares? The next big question that you need to answer is, do you invest passively or actively? And you want to make sure that you're choosing quite carefully there because as the stats show, index funds perform better than more than 80 plus percent of the time. All right, just going to jump into a couple of questions here. Um, Idelia says, would you recommend crypto as part of the investment mix or just stay away from them? Idelia, great question. And the answer is... I. I relate it back to the stages that I mentioned at the start, those different five different stages that people go through with their money. I get that it's sort of like, it depends partly on personal preference, but in my opinion, if you're just getting started with your money, investing into speculative investments, in my opinion, is a major mistake. Whereas if you've built some good momentum in your money and you're getting into those more advanced stages and you're particularly interested in those sorts of investments and you want to, you really want to do that, and you can do it in a way where you you're investing money that um, you know isn't needed for your core wealth building strategy, then I think that can be okay. I don't think anyone needs crypto, but I do think it's interesting. Personally, I've got a bit of Bitcoin in my investment portfolio. It just sort of sits on the side. So I think it has a place, but its place is as a small part of a considered investment portfolio at the right time, in my opinion. Hope that helps. Um, Nitin is asking a question about offset versus investments and saying if we keep money in an offset, we save 6% in interest, but if you get the investment, you need 10% return after tax. So basically, if you've got, if you're comparing putting money in an offset versus investing and your offset is going to save you 6% in interest, then for you to do better by investing, your investments need to perform, need to deliver you at least 6% after tax. More than 6% after tax for you to be ahead, less than 6% after tax and, and you're behind. Another question here, wanting to use Perla to invest in my kids' ETFs like NASDAQ or IVV. When they start working in 10 years, I want them to take it over and learn about it, share responsibility. Should I invest with the minor option or use my family trust that I already have set up? Uh, look, that's a good question. Firstly, you know, nice work on, on the kids investing. I would, I, firstly, I can't answer that question without giving financial advice and uh, getting in hot water with with the uh, with ASIC, etc. Um, but uh, I think both options can be can be good. Look, what I would suggest, I did a uh, a blog on the Pivot Wealth blog. There's one that's specific on the tax consequences of kids investing accounts. And so it is quite um, complex in terms of the rules, firstly, but also the considerations, secondly. And so I would encourage you to um, to give that a read and, and hope it sort of points you in the right direction. Another question from Liz says, "Do does Pivot 
do financial advice for dual citizens who have money and investments in their home country as well as AU. Look, I think when, if you think about financial advice and for people that are dual citizens, that generally financial advice in most countries is fairly tied to the country in which the advice is delivered. Certainly from a compliance perspective, it is, but even just practically that you, as an Australian financial advisor, I can help people set up Australian investments, Australian financial products. I can't help someone set up a, a product offshore necessarily. And so that creates a bit of a constraint. And so if you've got more money in one country than another, and depending on where your base is, you may benefit from seeking out um, advice in the country where you've got more money. That being said, we talk, we're happy to talk to people and, and because there are complex considerations there, I'd say it's probably worth a chat in the first instance with us or with uh, the advice firm that you're thinking about. And then they will be able to really understand that and uh, understand your position and give you a few questions to think about to make the right decision. Joe has a, a really good question to say, is an ETF the same as index funds? And if not, what are the main differences? And so, yes, um, that is, is a good question. I'm going to actually just crack on and answer that. And so in this section, I talk about the different types of investments. I'm going to talk about this fairly quickly in the interest of time because I can see a ton of questions coming through and keep those coming in, guys. But basically, if you're investing, I say share investments, but what that really means is shares, managed funds, ETFs, micro-investing, or child-specific investment accounts. And so going through each one of them in turn, and then I'll circle back to your, um, your question, Joe, that when you buy shares, you're basically buying a small slice of one company. And so you're entitled to a share of the profit of that company if they pay it out to their investors in the form of dividends. You're also entitled to a share of the growth in that business over time. Now, all of the other options that I mentioned here, managed funds, ETFs, and micro-investing and kids' investing accounts, that these are all generally investment options that give you access to a pool of shares, so a diversified pool of shares. And look, I completely get that this is a little bit confusing, but if you wanted to invest in an index fund, I'll just go back to my list here. If you wanted to invest into an index fund, you could invest into an index managed fund. You could invest into an index fund ETF, an index fund micro-investing account, and an index fund child-specific account. And so each of the each of the options have a little bit they're slightly nuanced in terms of their the differences between them. For example, with uh, managed funds, all investors sit in one pool and they all share the tax consequences when people are buying and selling. With an ETF, you own a tiny little slice of the underlying shares, and so if you don't sell, there are there's no capital gains consequences from that. Uh, micro investing is more like a managed fund as is the child specific investment accounts. And so, uh, yeah, so all of them can give you access to similar investments. And so, and I've actually got this here that, that basically that, cause the next logical question is, well, which one of those is best? If I want an index fund, should I choose a managed fund or should I choose a micro fund or should I choose, a, um, an ETF? And the reality is that the bottom line in terms of how much money you'll make is very, very small when, you, when you've got less than $200,000. Even above $200,000, up to $500,000 in investments, the, the bottom line difference, you're talking in the hundreds of dollars a year, maybe. I just did this actually for my... Um, for my latest book, which I've got another book coming out at the end of the year. And I looked at it and it was, I can't remember the exact number, but it was literally on $100,000. It was like less than $100 between an index, the an Australian share index fund and the same Australian share index fund, but in an ETF format. And so what that suggests is that you want to find a solution that's easy. And I go back to my comment at the start when I use James Clear's quote talking about you don't rise to the level of the go your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. In my opinion, when it comes to choosing the investment account that you're going to use, you want to choose an account that has an automatic the ability for you to automate your investment plan because then you systemize your investing and then you don't have to actually do anything. Now, I 
I'm a money guy. I'm a money nerd. I, I love money. I love markets. Um, but I automate all of my investing because I don't want to do it manually. And I know that I don't have to do it manually. This morning, I invest every Wednesday is my day for investing. This morning, money got invested. I was in a meeting. Like I'm not, I'm not going to rush out of a meeting and do that. I'm going to end up forgetting. And so I want a solution that's easy. And I, I think that there's a lot of value in that, particularly when you're in the process of building your wealth, that's going to have a much, much bigger impact than it will if you're um, choosing the optimal between an ETF and a managed fund. So I get that that doesn't, Joe, I hope that answers your question, but I get that it doesn't directly say which one's better, but I think you want to find one that's easy. Similarly, if you want to invest in, and like the the question, I, I can't recall exactly who asked that one, but you're investing for your kids and then you want to get your kids involved, these child-specific investment accounts are awesome for that because they uh, they provide an education platform and a tool where you can engage your kids in money and you can start teaching them about money. And that's super valuable. That's worth, you know, if you if you were to get that, but then you realize that 10 years down the line, you were $300 worse off because the, the ETF performed a tiny bit differently to the micro investing or the kid specific one, you're probably not going to care that much. You probably shouldn't care that much, um, in my opinion. And so, uh, I, yeah, the easy is better. Now, what that actually translates to in my, in, in my experience here is that, if you're just getting started investing, the micro investing options are typically the easiest way to get started. And the reason that they are is because you can invest with $5. Some of them, even you can invest with less than $5. Super easy to use. You don't have to muck around. When you invest in ETFs, you have to invest enough to um, buy the actual ETF, find the right ETF, trade in the market, harder to automate. Then you've got brokerage on top. So um I, you know, I think these can be a really good way to get started. That being said, a lot of different ways to be right. So if you've got a solution and ETFs, I think are great as well. If you've got a solution that works for you, you know, it works for you, but you want it to be easy and you want it to be automated. If you're just getting started, know that you're not setting things in stone, that getting started is going to be much more powerful for you than getting it perfect. And uh, look, your tax planning really is fairly crucial. Uh, I'm probably not going to get, I might just give you the super quick version of this because I can see that there's heaps of questions that are coming through and I'm keen to make some time for them. Basically, when you invest with, I'll just give you the super short version of this, that if you're investing, you can invest in your personal name or, you know, as we've had in some of the questions, you can invest through your super fund, through a trust or through another option now if you were to um if you were to invest in your personal name you pay tax at marginal tax rates if you invest through another entity you pay tax at those rates so your your personal marginal tax rates are up to 47 percent if you invest in your kids names then they've got a slightly different tax scale investment bonds um 30 percent tax on income no capital gains if you hold them for 10 years or more so there's some rules there super has the lowest tax rate but your super money is trapped until you're old and then you can invest through trusts and companies as well what i want to get across here is that there is a difference and i've looked at here to say if you've got 10 grand of investment income across a family mom dad a couple of kids a super fund and a company how much tax would you actually pay and you see that Tax planning, like being strategic with where you're owning your investments and who's paying the tax can mean the difference between paying no tax on the income and paying $4,700 in tax, which is clearly, that's $4,700 more that you can reinvest to grow your money faster or spend on today. And so you want to be, um, you want to be really considered with how you do that. Also, when you're investing for your kids that know that if you own the investments, you will pay the tax. So that's where a lot of people go, I want to invest for my kids and it's simple and easy. But you could, you, there are tax consequences down the line and you can invest in your kids' names, but then that has tax consequences in the short term or you can invest in through bonds, trusts and super funds. The, the real right answer there depends on how much you're doing. And if you're planning to do a lot, if you want to really set your kids up, then I would strongly suggest you seek out advice. Um, either way, I would strongly suggest you seek out research and know that there are tax consequences that come. Now, uh, look, I'm just, I'm actually going to skip over this section. 
just in the interest of time. But ultimately, you want to create savings capacity to allow you to, to save. I've got a heap of content on this on our social, so check it out there. But um, I think that that should be a focus in your investing approach. I also think that if you're if you're trying to create real generational wealth, then don't ignore increasing your income because there is a limit to how much you can cut your expenses, but there is no limit to how much you can increase your income. And I think that in today's cost of living crisis, people are finding the threshold between below which they can't increase their income. Uh, sorry, below which they can't cut their expenses further. So looking at increasing your income is a really powerful lever. Now, when you're making decisions around your planning and the decisions that you do moving forward, this is the approach that we take at Pivot, but it's the same approach that anyone can use if you're looking to make some decisions here. If you're thinking about investing for your kids or investing for yourself or how you build your generational wealth, but basically the steps that you want to go through, first focus on what you're doing, what's actually important to you and why. Then you want to clarify the moving parts. How much money have you got to work with? What's your savings capacity? What savings have you got in place? And then from there, you can look at the strategies. And what if I invested some, all, none? What's the impact? What if I bought a property instead? What's the impact? And from there, each of them are going to look and feel different. And you can choose the right one for you. The key step that you want to do, regardless of what you choose to do, is to automate as much as you possibly can so that you can systemize your success ultimately. And then from there, it's ongoing execution and refinement to keep things moving forward. Now, a couple of myths just to bust before I get into the questions. Don't have or earn enough money to invest. Look, I think micro investing in some platforms allow you to invest with as little as one cent. And I can guarantee you there is such a big mindset difference between investing $5 a week and investing $0 a week, even though the financial side is not a lot. Doing anything will make you feel good and better about your money and you will build on it from there. Um, if you're worried about choosing bad investments that you fail, simply just buy a slice of the whole market. Look at those index funds. They're a great place to get started and you should have a lot of confidence to follow through with them. If you don't, if you've got variable spending or income, you you want to create your own consistency with the right system around your money. And system, I've mentioned a few times, systemizing your approach is so important. So look, guys, I hope you found that helpful. I would share this model with you talking about getting from where you are to future state with your money. Now, most people, when they think about getting from where they are to future state, they think of it like a straight line, but because of the compounding impact of time and money, it's actually a curve. So it doesn't matter where you want to get to with your money that you need to save and invest a certain amount of money today. If you wait a week, a month, a year, five years, all that happens is you need to save more and invest more to end up in the same position. And sometimes putting yourself in the best position can become impossible. And so the sooner you start, the smallest the gap is. The longer you leave it, the more you have to do. So I suppose this is my like motivational pep talk to say, you know, take take the time take to make it happen. So guys, I'm going to um, jump into some questions. Uh, look, I've got a slide here and I'll, I'll pop this into the chat, but, you know, helping people with this sort of stuff is exactly what we do at Pivot Wealth. So if the, the stuff that we've covered today resonates and you want to talk, we do these 15 minute no obligation chats where um, we can help you talk through what opportunities might be there for you from a financial perspective, give you a bit of Q&A, but help you understand what you could do and what the next steps could look like. Uh, you can use a QR code that's on the screen or the link that's there as well. Um, so if you want to talk that through, look, I know that sometimes like we help people with this stuff, but sometimes people just need to push in the right direction. And we're happy to be that push if that's you. So anyway, that link's in the chat. Also, uh, check out our upcoming events and the socials that I've sent before. Yes, we will share the recording um, and slides as well. Now, I'm going to answer the questions. I just got that QR code and the link there uh, as well, if you want to look at that while we're talking. Um, so I'll yeah, just crack into these questions. One here from Aya says, I've recently moved to Australia and I'm looking to start my exposure to Australian markets. I have experience in investing in stocks and bonds, but would love to know where you think I should start learning about the AU markets, whether it's a book website or the laws or rules. Uh, well, look, you're in the right place. 
So we do a ton of content around that. So that could be a helpful starting point. In my completely biased opinion, if you were to ask me for books, I would say to check out my books. Uh, my last one, Replace Your Salary by Investing, and then the one that's getting re-released next week, Get Unstuck, um, or in a couple of weeks' time. Um, if you want to get really deep, you could get the Master Financial Planning Guide. That goes into a ton of detail. It's also an expensive book, but it's a, it's a good book, um, but it's pretty dense and full of jargon. Uh, otherwise, AFR for you know, market news and, and what's going on there uh, as well. Podcasts are good. We've got a podcast also, uh, Equity Mates, She's on the Money is a really good one as well. Uh, yeah, hopefully that's enough to get you started. Hit me up if you get stuck. Um, one from Michelle, would you, and I'm just going to stick around for an extra couple of minutes. I appreciate that some people need to jump. So uh, feel free to jump. Thank you for all the guys that are sending through. Thanks on the on the chat. You are very welcome. I'm going to stick around for another couple of minutes and uh, answer questions. So if you, if you want to hear them, uh, stick around. Michelle's got a question here. Should you set up, should you set up for dividends to be in full participation in reinvestment plan? Look, personally, I don't like dividend reinvestment plans. That's my personal opinion. But for some people, they, you know, it's easy for them. I prefer to use an investment account where it can just kick the money into your investment account and then get reinvested in line with that plan. But some people like dividend reinvestment. So up to you. It does make it a little bit complicated from a tax tracking perspective, um, which is part of the reason I don't like them. So uh, up to you is the answer there, Michelle. Jane says, uh, international US ETFs usually pay less dividends, but have high growth. If you are trying to create passive income stream, why do you need international share ETFs? Good question, Jane. Look, the US market has outperformed the Australian market over the last you know, a couple of decades, really. And so that's why I think it's probably in, why I personally want exposure to uh, to the to US markets and why I think it can be quite valuable. Keep in mind, if you're trying to set up yourself up for financial independence, there's two clear stages, well, two and maybe a tr transition. Oh, thank you, Zoom. Um, and maybe a transition stage that you've got when you're building your assets and then the the late late the final stage is when you're living off the assets, and sometimes there's a transition stage in between. And so, for example, property is one of the most effective ways to build your wealth because you're using the power of borrowed money to invest. But it's also one of the worst for income. If you've got a million dollars in a property, it's probably going to give you half the income that a nice Australian share portfolio would be. And so, what you you know for a lot of people. You want to take advantage of the growth that you get on property. And so you can do that, but then you need to sell a property if you want to maximize the income. And so there's, and this is what, you know, I was referring to earlier when I talk about the stages of money success and the, what you can do that you want to make the right move for the stage and then, and then set things up in a way so that you're right for the stage that you're in. I hope that makes sense, Jane. What that means is that you could crank US shares while you're building your wealth, but then you need a plan to transition out of them and maybe you want more Australian shares with more income when you're living off the income. Because while you're setting up for financial independence, you actually don't need the income. And in those cases, Australian shares that pay more income, which is then taxable, means you're paying more tax, which means your shares actually grow slower and means that it takes longer. So- it's sort of like a bit of a catch-22. Got one from Princess that says, shout out Princess, I, got, I have the Perla app and want to start with the micro that you just said. I've added $100 already, so I don't know which ones to pick for the micro. Uh, look, um, I would say do a bit of research into the options that are there. Um, I, yeah, I think if you, the you want to set, your investing philosophy. And one of the biggest parts of that is, do you want to invest in active investments or passive investments? And so I'm a big believer in passive investments. We do, a lot of our clients choose to invest passively as well. And that means you're buying index funds. So then you want to go, okay, well, now I'm going to look for the index funds. The next question is exactly in line with the last comment on, do you have Australian shares only or international shares only or some sort of combination? Generally, a combination is good, generally. 
Um, and so you might be looking for an index fund option, which has a combination of Australian shares and international shares in there. And that can narrow down the field. Then you might do a little bit of research and you choose from there. I hope that one helps, Princess. Mitsu says, could you go back to the slide that had the steps for focus, plan, clarify? Yes, I can. I can go to that slide while we're chatting. Just let me do that. Uh, Trung says, you mentioned 40, 60 international shares portfolios are ideal. Why 40% of Australia when they make up a small percentage of the world? Um, really good question. The reason is because you buy your coffee with Australian dollars. You don't buy it with euros or US dollars or pesos. And so generally, it's quite important to have um, a, a, you know, a solid core of investments in the country that's denominated in the money that you're actually spending on a day-to-day -day basis. Hope that helps. Uh, all right, guys. Well, look, we've gone five minutes over time. Thank you guys for all of the questions. That is uh, really so awesome to see. Please, I'd love for you guys to jump onto the Get Unstuck event that is coming up in just a couple of weeks' time. I'm not talking it up too much that um, uh, it is sharing a bunch of stuff that I've never shared with the public before. So get around that. Tell all your mates. Uh, thanks for today, guys. And I will catch you on the next one. Bye for now.